All righty, guys. Um, good evening, and um, thanks for uh, joining the presentation. So we're going to be discussing um, fragility fractures of the pelvis tonight. Um, I mean, some of you may have seen some of the slides, and um, I just don't remember when the last time I gave the talk, but I can assure you that there are um, new slides and uh, there's new content, so please um, stay switched on. So it's a, you know, like most things we do when we present, it's a very vast topic. And um, so an hour or two hours doesn't do it justice, but I'm going to try and go through just the fundamentals of, um, of pelvis fragility fractures. So it's really just um, just an appetizer. And if you like what you hear and you want to um, investigate and um, and get you know more in, in touch with the content, there are multiple courses available. You can uh, have a whole two day course on just um, fertility fractures and um, endothelgeriatrics. So most of the time when, when we discuss fragility fractures is often when I present on neck of femur fractures, but uh, there's a whole new entity, which is pelvis fragility fractures. So um, now there's a couple of things that we need to unlearn um, when it comes to pelvic fractures. And the main thing is that when you see this kind of fracture, which is what we see probably nine times out of 10 in our clinical practice, these are, these are stable fractures in, in young patients. It's a classic lateral compression injury. And you expect the patient to maybe be admitted for a few days. And then, um, you know, once they pass their physio straight leg raise test, then there are going to be discharged and you're probably never going to see them again. So that's true in, in young patients. But when it comes to elderly patients, you must accept that these can, can present challenges. They are not as straightforward. So a fracture that presents like this, that many of us would be happy and, um, and eager to discharge as soon as possible. When you see them in six weeks time, instead of being united, they may look like this. And um, this is really a result of um, underlying osteoporosis and also just the inherent fragility nature around the pelvis for, for these patients. So the talk for tonight really centers around not only pelvis fractures in the elderly, but you know we're going to discuss a little bit on osteoporosis as well. So by way of definition, what is osteoporosis? It's really a, so, you know, it, it's a disease process that's characterized by low bone mass and structural deterioration in bone tissue. And the difference here is that there's no bony infiltration by any malignancy. There's no metabolic process that destroys bone. It is purely a structural issue um, with patients as they grow older. And for us in orthopedics, probably the most commonest um, manifestation is going to be necrofemur fractures. And that's really the only time we'll discuss it. And um, you will know that even in the Monday morning meeting, you know, you can get away with, you know, vertebral compression fractures, radius fractures, humerus fractures, without mentioning osteoporosis. But the minute you're faced with a necrofemur fracture, and you don't mention osteoporosis, then we are all going to be, you know, um, at your case. But really, osteoporosis affects more than just um, the neck of femur. But I suppose the commonest presentation to us and probably the most devastating presentation is of neck of femur fractures. So why do these fractures matter? Well, because it's a disease process that's here to stay. And, um, you know, patients are living longer and longer. They are more demanding. So the, and, and many patients are on bone preserving medication and also life preserving medication. So they live longer and the bones are becoming more and more fragile. And there's been an increase in the incidence 
funny enough, much more than neck or femur fractures, actually, when it comes to, to pelvis fragility fractures. And um, after the age of 60 years old, uh, more than 90% of pelvis fractures that you see are going to be fragility in nature. Osteoporosis is a risk factor. And um, this then leads to a reduction in the patient's mobility, as well as increased dependency. And many of them never return to their pre-morbid level of function. One third of them never return to, you know, to independent mobilization. And one third of these patients never return to their home. So they go on to either nursing home or if they do return home, then they require full-time nursing care. And, um, and it's an entity that is really under, underappreciated by us. And like I said, we tend to focus more on neck of femur fractures to the detriment um, of every other um, fragility fracture. So when it comes to fragility fractures of the pelvis or FFP, like I said, it's a fairly new entity that um, has been recognized um, to be far more important than has been appreciated. And the frequency is, is increasing, mostly one due to increased pickup, but also like I said, due to patients living longer and longer. And the difference here is that, you know, the OTA or the Young and Burgess classification don't adequately reflect the fracture morphology and the mechanism of trauma because these are all low energy injuries, unlike, um, uh, you know, the classic, you know, lateral compression or a APC 1, 2, 3 or AO classification B and C type injuries, which are high energy injuries in the young patients. So the difference here is that if a young patient presents with a pelvis fracture, you expect the, um, you know, you expect them to heal and you expect the stability to increase over time. Whereas in the neck of, in pelvis fractures um, from fragility, then there's um, the reverse, which is increasing instability over time. So if I were to juxtapose them against, you know, uh, neck of femur fractures, when a patient like this presents, you know, there is no question in anyone's mind that this fracture needs surgical intervention unless the patient is really too unwell to undergo surgery. But the conservative options are really not well tolerated and by both patients and surgeons. So it's not really an option and it's acceptable virtually worldwide that, uh, that you must intervene surgically. We had uh, this discussion um, yesterday in the, uh, in the morning meeting, distal radius fractures. Again, same thing, you know, there's going to be some form of intervention, whether you manip and um, pop, manip and K wire, or manip and plate. But in reality, many of them will get um, open reduction and internal fixation. And again, that's never questioned, it's become standard. It's the same with uh, vertebral fractures. If a patient presents with compression fractures, certainly in the more affluent setting, like the uh, you know in the private practice or maybe in some of the you know first world countries, so these patients will get you no know, vertebral plasty or or um, or kyphoplasty, and again it is accepted as you know a standard of care that many people can never argue against. But the minute you present with a pelvis fracture, then the answer is no, don't intervene, just leave it alone. And this is where it, it, it just boggles the mind. And we're going to discuss this later on. And importantly, I'm not suggesting that every single pelvis fracture deserves surgical intervention, but it certainly deserves much more than just C and discharge. So the message here is that we need to act with the same you know, um, aggression and the same um, vigilance when it comes to pelvis fragility fractures. And most of this um, cut or, or previous treatment um, preferences have got to do with you know, local resources and local surgical availability and expertise in the sense that you know, many people have not been trained in a fixation of pelvis fractures, and certainly 
um, was the case from 10, 20 years ago. So the conservative option was by default, not necessarily by choice. But if there is available intervention, then these patients deserve as much surgical care when required as, um, as any other patient. So when it comes to classification, so this is an article um, that you must familiarize yourselves with. Uh, it's uh, the first proper comprehensive classification from Paul Romans and, um, and Alexander Hoffman from Germany. So it's basically a progression um, from really stable, you know, lateral compression type fractures all the way up to, you know, um, by um, sacral fractures with both anterior and, um, and posterior involvement. And again, similar to the discussion yesterday, you know, we spoke about uh, Mayfield progression in, uh, in couple dislocations. It's the same thing here. There is a progression from stable to, to unstable and stable fractures really involving only the anterior column and unstable fractures involving you know, both the anterior and the posterior component of the ring. So whenever you're faced with uh, a, a, a non-union in the elderly, you need to actively exclude the presence of a posterior lesion. And right from your medical officer days, you were taught that um, the pelvis is a ring. So what happens anteriorly often happens at the back as well. But um, in most young patients, uh, it's the anterior lesion that really matters, that really gets seen. And because of the 3D nature of the pelvis, you often don't see the posterior component until you do a CT scan. So if you present it with an image like this and you think ah, it's just an anterior component that's involved, it's a non-union, yes, but it's probably gonna get better. The simple truth is that it doesn't often get better. And when you see this X-ray, you have to look at the posterior lesion and all the patients require a CT scan. And because by the time they get to the stage of a non-union, it's probably been three or six weeks or three months after the initial injury and they are now progressing and they will not get better. So this is the time to, to intervene and you need to appreciate the presence of the posterior lesion. And this is where now the, the mind shift needs to, to, to take place because um, like I said, again, we see mostly young patients with pelvis fractures. So you can see a young patient with bilateral anterior ring injuries like this patient here. And when you X-ray them, it's possible that this posterior part of the, of the sacrum will not be involved because of the quality of the bone and um, how they can withstand the trauma to the pelvis. So in, in young patients, you can treat this non-operatively and expect it to get better. But if you are faced with an elderly patient, when you see an established non-union anteriorly, it doesn't often show on the X-ray um, that there is posterior involvement, but almost always by the time the anterior pelvis first fails to unite, then it means that there's been you no know, chronic instability and the, the posterior components are also involved. So the example on your screen now just shows um, involvement and a non-union of the anterior pelvis ring. And if you then do a CT scan, you're bound to, found, uh, to find um, involvement posteriorly with both, um, I mean, mostly the left uh, sacrum and sometimes it's the joint, but most of the time they go to the sacral ala for, for the um, instability and the non-union and often it progresses. So here, initially the left side of the joint was involved and then over time, you can see there's now um, the beginning of instability on the right part of the sacrum. This is when we don't intervene. So I've got some clinical examples to show you. So this is a 
78 year old female. Um, I'm gonna pick a volunteer, um, Peter. So this is uh, 78 year old and she's come to the trauma unit and she was walking and she tripped on, um, she was walking at the, at the Rondabosh Common and that's what she presents with. She'll just take us through what you would do for her. So, um, yeah, how long? So it's up to three months. No, no, no. This is no, no. Ignore the three month part. Like just three month this part. Is her presentation, yeah. and she's coming to you today. So you have to assess, assess her pain, and get a good history of what actually happened to her, um, okay. and exclude other injuries. But I mean, looking at the X-ray, she's got a superior inferior pubic ramoid fractures on the left. Yeah. But after what you said now, you have to check at the back. So you have to check if there's any posterior tenderness as well. Okay. So before what I said now, what would you have done? What I would have done is counseled and discharged. <laughs> 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 okay. Physio counseled, discharged. Yeah. And what are the instructions when you discharge them? Is is partial weight bearing, which no elderly person can do. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, so yeah, I mean, that's what, I mean, there's nothing, you know, um, unusual about your answer. That's what was done for this patient. And, um, and then you were, you know, I mean, you obviously discharged her and you said, okay, fine, you are good to go. But then she comes back at three months to say, listen, doctor, I'm sorry, but my pain is just not getting better. If anything, it's worse. And you send it for an X-ray and that's what you get. Now. Yeah, so now you can see established um, non-union of the, especially the, and displacement of the superior part um, of the pubis, um, but also with um, diastasis of the SI joint on the left, which obviously contributed to the non-union that she's sitting with now. So now it's three months down the line and he, it's a non-union and it's not better, so it needs intervention which should have actually happened at the beginning. No, no, not necessarily. I mean, how many times have you seen intervention for a pelvis non-union? Not once. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. So, then what would, so what would you do? So, yeah, so now you have to, so you have to see where, her, where the area of the pain is, where the most pain is though, but you would expect that the pain would still be, um, groin, hip, um, but with associated left lower lumbar pain as well. Um, I have to say in, in the past, what I have done or would have done. No, it's um, fine, no, no, I'll let you rest. Uh, let's um, pick on Mohammed Daoub. Yes, bro. Okay, so now this is her at three months. Yeah, um, so it's the same patient, and then we, um, she's got an established non union. And as Peter mentioned, there's some diastasis on the back. So basically, um, I need to confirm if there's a fracture in the back or not. So I would like to do further image, I would like to do the CT scan for this patient. Okay, so, so, all righty. So now, uh, okay, fine. So this is, I mean, again, typically what I will do to me is my PowerPoint now. So this is her at three months. And again, typically what happens is that she gets sent off. So you know what, it's like, oh, honestly, it's a pelvis fracture, it's stable. Just get on with her life, it's gonna get better. And she gets sent out. And now she comes back at, um, at six months, looking like that. So now you wanted to do a CT scan. It wasn't done at three months, unfortunately, but now at six months, um, what do you think is going on? Uh, okay, so this is um, an axial view of the CT scan. Um, and then again, you can see there's a fracture to the sacrum um, and it's slightly displaced as well. Um, and not sure on the left side, I don't see any fracture there. 
Yeah, but that's that's what happened. If it's the same patient, so then it means that she had a hood, um, called an anterior and a posterior um, fracture. And um, and again, it's non-union. Okay, so what do you tell her? Um, look, Prof, I mean, um, um, so it's it's a displaced fracture, and there's established non-union, and and basically, um, I think if you're going to leave it like that, so then the fracture will progress to the other side, and patients will have a CP pain, etc. So I think at this stage, um, I will refer her to the prof to tumble, and then <laughs> so, <she's> so, <laughs> so I think she might need a. I'm not sure, Prof, to be honest with you, but I would, if the patients have CV pain uh, interfering with her daily activity, I would um, consider doing the surgery. That's my uh, opinion. Okay. Um, okay, so we'll leave it there. Let's, as, so now, now, I mean, for everyone else, no, this is meant to be um, an educational moment. So there's no picking on anyone. So any, any names that I don't recognize, I just want to hear how other people would, um, you know, approach this from other institutions. So a name I don't recognize is Ndomiso, Ndomiso Mavuso. Just feel free, sorry for putting you on the spot. Like just like, you know, to tell us what you would do. Uh, hi. Firstly, where are you joining us from? Uh, from UK, ZN. Okay, fantastic. Welcome, welcome, Dumiso. Okay, so now this is at six months. What would you do? Okay, um, so uh, we, we, we've established that we have uh, a non-union um, at, uh, at, at six months. And a 78-year-old lady was... My first thing is is, is to um, to to basically find out what do I think may have been the cause of the union. Um, uh, so, uh, looking at the CT scan that I'm seeing here, I can't see any um, um, lesions um, or anything like that. Uh, that may have been a, a cause um, either from uh, bone or soft tissue. Um, so then I think uh, she's coming in with persistent pain, Prof, you said. Yes, yeah. Yeah, so my um, aims is to, to one, like I said, uh, see if I can establish a cause and then um, treat uh, the pain. Uh, I know that Mohammed said uh, to offer a surgery, um, but uh, I'm just trying to think in, in this case uh, what my surgery would be. I uh, would probably have to um, um, recon reconstruct the ring again, so um, from the back and, and the front. Um, it's, it's just a non union from um, uh, non pathological causes. Okay, let's leave it there. Um, now I'm going to pick on Jephthah. Thanks, Ndemiso. Jephthah? Uh, Prof, good evening. I'm Jephthah. I'm from Vitz University. Okay, welcome. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I kind of agree with the uh, within to me, so uh, like the first thing is to look at the cause of the non-union um, from systemic to local um, causes. But uh, in this case, also what I would want to mention is that we have an anterior ring and posterior ring fracture. Uh, in itself, it's uh, unstable and. Um, I think that's contributory to the non-union because it's unstable and the patient has been trying to wait bare. So the strain on those fractures are sort of high. 
So in that case, um, I do agree we need to put in some stability to um, uh, allow a union of this fracture. We might need to add some bone graft to sort of augment uh, the healing um, of this fracture. Um, I think that's what I would go for. But in terms of stability, um, we have fracture anteriorly and posteriorly. My main aim would be to stabilize the posterior ring and hopefully that the anterior aspect will be close enough to sort of heal. Okay. Alrighty. So, I mean, that's the answer that's obviously correct for tonight. But if this was you seeing this woman in OPD two weeks ago, would you have thought any differently? Okay. Uh, I, sorry. No, no, Prof. no, no. I'll leave you there. Let's okay. get someone else. Um, okay. Yenziwe Gemma. Two weeks ago, you're on your own in OPD and you're seeing this woman. What would you have discussed with her? Um, hi, Prof. I'm also from Vits. Also from um, Okay, great. Yes. So, in, on, in all honesty, I think I probably would have um, continued non operative management. Um, and I probably maybe would have um, optimized her. Uh, osteoporotic treatment so maybe um, continue on like calcium vitamin D um, send it to metabolic in terms of bisphosphonates uh, yeah. but I, I, I doubt I would have, have operated to be honest yeah no I mean that's fantastic so that is you know halfway through what needs to be done because you've recognized that there is a problem here and the problem is underlying osteoporosis so if you don't intervene in any way surgically, but you know that you must intervene osteoporotically, if that's a okay. word, but you know, so vitamin D, calcium, yes. So that you need to do and you must involve endocrine because you're not just dealing with a straightforward and, um, and harmless non-union, it's a non-union and it's got to do with osteoporosis. So that's halfway, um, you know, towards what needs to be done. So let's, uh, let me find my slide. Okay, so, I mean, in reality, you know, most of, peop of the people would not have intervened. It's like, okay, you know what, mom, it's like, oh, man, it's a lateral compression pelvis fracture. We expect it to get better and it's gonna get better. Here's some Panado, we'll see you in 18 months. And, uh, and she comes at 18 months looking like that. So now let's pick on Francis. Francis? Hi, Prof. Um, yeah, so, so uh, to take, take a step back um, with the previous question, I would have probably uh, considered um, maybe putting her in a wheelchair just to <laughs> lend st some stability, stop trying to wait bare, uh, but I, I don't know if I would have operated. Yeah, that's um, like Eastern Cape approach wheelchair and the Sasa Grant. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so now, now we've got a bigger problem. We've got additionally um, new fractures on the right side of Imperial Superior Amos. SI joint widening probably with associated uh, sacral fracture and a right neck of femur fracture. So um, what, what do you think has happened here? Why did she get all those fractures? With, I would imagine there'd be some history of trauma, maybe a, a low energy fall. Uh, she's gotten weaker, probably immobility. Um, or because she's getting more and more frail, she's getting sarcopenia. Yeah. She can't mobilize, and she's mm. a, like a fall risk. Because yeah. she's lost her core strength because her AMI. Um, and because I put her in a wheelchair. <laughs> yeah, so there's no, there's no core yeah. strength. So that's why she fell again. Yeah, so, so now she's got trauma. Now she's got an echo fever. Now we have to intervene surgically. Or so, or so, so we say. Um, it's obviously uh, tricky now. So, I mean, the, the hip, we, we'd go down the, the arthroplasty 
um, algorithm, which I don't think is much of tonight's talk, and as as has mentioned, optimizing her uh, metabolic uh, management of her osteoporosis. Now you're in the theater already, can um, think about addressing the pelvis, uh, but now it's a very big outing for her, so she needs to be optimized well surgically, and she's a far worse taste than she would have been originally. Um, we would probably um, obviously look at fixation ac across the back uh, with SI screws, possibly from one from each side, but simply um, uh, transiliac, um, both side uh, across both uh, SI, both sides of the SI, both SI joints. I mean, um, and then anteriorly, uh, yeah. Probably also something to address the anterior ring, uh, depending on her ability to tolerate the surgery. You can consider either anterior exfix, exfix or um, plating. Probably crossing the ramus. There isn't to worry about future childbirth and those kinds of issues. Um, she's Seventy-eight. So I doubt she's going yeah. to have more children. No, exactly. But, but, um, course, but I mean, it's sort of th <laughs> thinking about exfix versus plating. Um, the x probably isn't well going to be well tolerated if she wants to mobilize. I don't know if she can mobilize anymore yeah. with her status, uh, but it would be yeah. less invasive. Yeah. No, no, I mean, yeah, um, that, that's fine. So, I mean, I sort of just use this case just to illustrate, obviously, like the worst case scenario that this is what happens and this is what can happen when these fractures go unrecognized and Many of the patients, of course, never get to this stage because once they've been discharged and they can't walk again, they get told to use a wheelchair until they get better. And many of them never get better. And they just use a wheelchair permanently because they were told that that's it for you. You know, you can't, um, you can walk again. So if we go back, if you then look at their history, many patients will have had some kind of a warning fracture. And the warning fracture is that first fracture you get that is osteoporosis related. And most of the time, it's going to be a distal radius fracture or it's going to be a proximal humerus fracture. And if you dig deeper into their history, many patients will have had this fracture. But like we do all the time, they come in, we fix the uh, fracture, don't think about osteoporosis and, um, and we send them off. And then they are then exposed because once you've sustained the first fragility fracture, then your risk of sustaining subsequent pelvis fracture or subsequent osteoporosis related fractures is much higher than someone who hasn't had that warning fracture. So that's why we call it a cry for help. So when someone comes to you with a distal radius fracture, think about osteoporosis, think about investigation and think about an appropriate medication for them. So what challenges do you face with um, elderly patients with osteoporosis? Firstly, they present with abnormal bone, with soft bone, and many of the implants that we use and many of our interventions that we have are really designed for young patients. You know, young patients with good bone, with good physiology, and with good um, you know, expected outcomes. These patients come in with multiple medical comorbidities, which again, make it a bit more interesting and a bit challenging for when you want to intervene and how you intervene. There's also increasing level of um, no activity for elderly patients. And I mean, what was acceptable 20 years ago for an 80 year old is no longer acceptable. They want to get fixed or replaced and they want to go back out and be, and be active. And I mean, we've heard the commercial on the radio that many, or rather, the first patient who will live up to the age of 200 has been born already. So patients are living longer and longer and longer. So they want to remain more and more active deep into their, you know, um, into their adult or elderly lives. And um, we saw earlier on that, you know, or at least we heard that elderly patients cannot do non-weight bearing. They cannot do touch weight bearing. So if you're going to intervene, You've got one shot to make it work and it has to be stable enough that they can walk on it. And, um, you know, 
dare I say that there's insufficient knowledge of osteoporosis by orthopedic surgeons. It's something that is somewhere at the back of our minds, but we don't really pay much attention to it and we think it's somebody else's problem. But the reality is that many of these patients will present to us long before they need to present to endocrine, long before they, they need to present to physicians for osteoporosis. We often the first specialty that they consult. So it's important that we get you know, um, the ball in motion in terms of osteoporosis care. And also many of us don't appreciate the need for secondary intervention. And like I said, once the patient sustains the first osteoporosis fracture, then they have uh, increased risk of sustaining um, the subsequent fracture. So how do we go around this? It's uh, So there's like um, a fairly new sort of entity or setup called the Fracture Liaison Service. And this really is just basically multidisciplinary orthopedic care for patients with an osteoporosis fracture. And, you know, basically it also appreciates the need to involve other specialties. So it's not orthopedics only problem. You must get physicians involved, whether as general physicians or endocrinologists or physicians with an interest in osteoporosis, like rheumatologists, but there has to be like a geriatric fracture care system in place or a fracture liaison service. You can call it anything you want to call it, but you need to have a multidisciplinary team and the team needs to conduct teaching and research. You need to meet regularly uh, to discuss um, your outcomes and how best to intervene and how to make proper use of your setup. You need to have the patients follow, followed up. They need to have a DEXA scan in the, um, as inpatients. They need to have um, bisphosphonates uh, during their first in-hospital stay. And around the world, only 30% of patients will have a proper workup for osteoporosis for their neck of femur fracture admission. It's, like I said, it's universal. It's a problem um, around the world. We have had um, studies in our own unit where we've looked at um, our quality of care and with the first study, we failed dismally. We were no better than the other 30% of the world that um, only got it right. And we put systems in place and we have put protocols in place. And um, we've got Bayanda now working on her MED to see if we have improved our, um, our approach and our intervention. So hopefully we'll get the results um, this September at the Congress, but you need to have a system in place for better outcomes and it's been proven scientifically that this is the only way to make a difference is to have a multidisciplinary team so like i said you know in this team we as orthopedic surgeons are key because when the patient comes they come to us first they will come to us with the pelvis fracture or with the radius fracture and it's up to us to initiate the team approach and you know, if we don't do it, nobody will do it because the physicians aren't aware of patients in our ward. So we need to be the champions for secondary prevention, unless in some places you have a dedicated nurse or a physician to do this for you. So I'm lucky in that I also work in the private sector whereby we have a dedicated um, uh, fracture liaison service. It's actually the first one to be accredited in Africa by the International Osteoporosis Foundation, where when a patient comes in, they automatically get tagged in the trauma unit, but this is a neck of femur fracture patient. Then they are fast tracked through casualty. They get a stamp on their file that says this is a neck of femur fracture patient and their care needs to be expedite, um, expedited. They get rapid clearance by a physician. They get seen by a physiotherapist before surgery and they get their surgery as soon as possible. And then afterwards, they get seen by a dietitian and by, uh, by a physiotherapist just to get them back to, to um, active mobilization because uh, again, most of the time it's elderly patients. So they cannot afford to be in bed for a long time because they get rapid muscle wasting and sarcopenia. 
So the whole concept that we follow is called capture the fracture. You see someone with a necrofemur fracture or a, or a osteoporosis fracture, then basically the whole system is an autopilot and they get seen by everyone that they need to get seen by. So typically what we do for pelvis um, fragility fracture patients is you know, stabilization and bone grafting. And this is the example that you see. So on the left of your screen is an established non-union that has been treated with bone grafting and anterior you know, pelvis plating. And we often take bone graft from the iliac wing. And you can see there was some bone graft left over. Here's some change there, but she's now united. So that's the approach that once the non-union is established, you need rigid fixation and you need a bone grafting to stimulate the biology. Okay, so another example um, of a mountain biker and um, she's fairly active and um, comes in and she's got, so there's a pelvis fracture, of, I mean a pelvis X-ray on the right, also on your left, and we have zoomed in um, on, on the right of your screen. So I'm gonna, let me just see now who to pick on. This is the last time I pick on someone, I promise. Um, who have I not picked on? ZSL, who is ZSL? Or is it only the computer that's attending? There's no one behind the ZSL, are you there? Okay. Uh, Prof, I think it's Zama and she's on call, so I'm not, I'm not sure if she's busy maybe. Oh, so she left the computer to attend. Okay, well then, Skalk, you take your place. I immediately regret this decision. <laughs> Ready? So, yeah, so. There's a 56 year old mountain biker, very active. She rides every single week and Okay, I'm just taking a look there at the x-ray. It's not very clear, but it looks like there's a, a, a right superior pubic remo fracture. And just looking at the, on this AP view alone and the, um, the small other image on the right, the half oblique view, uh, I don't see any disruption in the, in the posterior um, pelvic ring, but I would probably want to get um, maybe different views for that. Yeah, okay, fine. Look, again, there's an answer before tonight and an answer after, I don't know, after the talk, but I mean, what would you have done in reality? like given those x-rays of the pelvis? Well, yeah, um, based on these x-rays, probably would have um, given the patient appropriate analgesia and um, physiotherapy in the other emergency unit or as an inpatient until um, they fit for uh, possible discharge via physio with an assistive device, can straight leg raise, etc., cetera, and um, probably follow them up as an outpatient. That would be my... Um, my thinking before this uh, evening. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I agree. Again, that's like something very reasonable. That's what I would have done too. But I think the difference between me and you is that I would then ask you to come back at six weeks. And so she comes back at six weeks. She's looking like that. And she comes back at, so again, six weeks, you know, so okay, vitamin D, maybe, um, referral to endocrine, but again, like at age 56, you're not really convinced that, that it's anything else, you know? So you're happy to just go the conservative road. So that's had six weeks looking like that. But what's happening here now is that what was initially on the right side only is now starting to show on the left. So I'm gonna, let's see, um, Ernest. Uh, hi, Prof. Um, uh, Antri. Yes. Oh, lovely. Fantastic. How are things in East London? 
Uh, no, it's uh, poor Elizabeth, but I'm just now at uh, Stellenbosch oh. for the for the senior rotations. Yeah. Oh, okay. Sorry, sorry. Okay, lovely. Okay, well, let's hear then. Look, well, again, I think the the discussion. The no, PE is then K is London. Is <laughs> yes, it is. Let's see. I think the 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 what what has been discussed uh, before, as you are saying, that is a treatment after the talk and a treatment before the talk. But um, you know, just as as reiterating what has been discussed, essentially, seeing this patient at nine weeks. Uh, we would generally make sure that the osteoporosis workup uh, is started and refer her accordingly, and then give analgesia, and then uh, allow her also to get some um, uh, to to mobilize as pain allows. Uh, if she needs a walking frame, then we can we can do give her that. But um, after the talk that we've had. Uh, it's clear that from these images that she has got some pelvic instability and essentially is actually worsening. So for her now, the next step would probably be to do a CT scan to be able to um, assess the whole pelvic ring and and to to decide uh, on any further surgical intervention. Um, most likely now, from what we've been discussing. You know, you need to optimize a uh, osteoporotic treatment, but then you also have to then consider some form of um, stabilization, which might be um, anterior plating and maybe uh, stabilizing the, the the posterior part of the ring as well. Yeah. Now, look, again, that's um, that's correct. But now, in reality, is that I mean, she came. You know, I mean, I'd been seeing her, of course, like from from um, from about six weeks. And at nine weeks, I said, listen, no, we are dealing with more than just um, a, you know, straightforward pelvis fracture here. I think you've got osteoporosis. And she's like, hell no. I run, I cycle, I'm always out in the sun. I can't possibly be osteoporotic. So let's just give it more time. I'm sure it's going to heal, which is something you'll get for many patients. And fine. So at nine, at nine weeks, we agree to give it a bit more time. But at least put her on. I mean, she will continue her on you know, um, on vitamin D. Importantly, said, so, okay, fine. We'll see you in three weeks. And she comes back. This is now at twelve weeks, and she's looking like this. And remember what she looked like when she came in. You could hardly see the fracture. You know. So now I was like, okay, fine. Now we we at three months now. You're getting worse. You haven't been on your bike. You can't walk. You can't run. You're in constant pain. So. Let's get over the denialism and accept that you may have osteoporosis. And reluctantly and uh, begrudgingly, she agrees to, to investigation. And of course, the first thing we did was a vitamin D and it's 5.7. And I mean, normal has to be above 30. And her T-score is minus 3.4, which is like deep into osteoporosis territory. And... Um, so next up, then of course she must have surgery because, so if you look on the right, um, uh, actually on your left, but the right LA wing, she had had bone grafting for a tibia non-union. So hence the defect there. So I said, hey, listen, we need to, to do bone grafting for you. And on the CT scan, in fact, even on this picture, you can see there's a whole lot more activity going on. So, uh, if you look at the sclerosis on, on the left sacrum, so she needed anterior plating and she needed um, a left sacral index group. And um, that's her post-op. And she then went on to unite. Now you can appreciate the union anteriorly and a whole lot more sclerosis and density at the back. So she went on to unite. So, I um, mean, the lesson here being that, you know, osteoporosis, can be encountered in patients who are much younger than what you expect to see um, osteoporosis in. And once she was optimized medically and optimized surgically, she then went on to unite and um, went back to mountain biking. So I've alluded to this previously that what you often are faced with in osteoporosis is abnormal bone and it's very soft bone. And if you were to, I mean, when you do a 3D CT scan, just look at how much you know bone loss there is. I mean, this 
in a normal patient is very thin bone to begin with. And in osteoporosis, they lose the bone completely in the iliac wings and also on the lateral part of the sacrum. And we'll come to this um, just now why it's important to know where the, the strong bony columns are in order to get per, um, you know, good fixation from your reduction. So the bony columns are firstly, if you do an SI screw, like I showed you in the CT scan here, there's no bone on the sacral ala. So there's no purchase that you get here. So the purchase you will get will, if, will be from the lateral ileum, from the middle of the sacrum, the other part of the sacrum and across to the other ileum. So your screws have to be anchored in the strong bone uh, bony columns. The next best part is above the acetabulum, so supraacetabular, and also down into the posterior um, column, the so-called fossa screw. So if you can get your screws down the, into a posterior column, supraacetabular, transsacral, and also down into the inferior ramus, that's the best bony um, window that you've got. So here's an example of um, a fossa screw. Um, so example of Try, you know, going transsacral, you've got your posterior column fossa screw, and you've got your screws engaging the inferior ramus. That's where the pelvis gets loaded mostly, and that's where most of your bony um, pressures will come from. Another example, again, make use of the posterior column or the teardrop or the fossa screw make use of the supracetabular bone because of the natural loading there's good bone here then you get better purchase and if you can then you must um, try and get transsacral trans iliac screws because if you look at the CT scan again lateral area of the sacrum there's no bone to speak of so your bony columns are the lateral part of the ileum middle of sacrum and lateral part of the other of the other ileum. So these are transsacral screws. And the beauty here is that, you know, there's always concern about crossing a, an unaffected um, sacral ileic joint, but in reality, there's very little motion, like seven degrees of motion only in the, in the SI, excuse me, SI joint. And patients do not feel the difference at all. So you get far more stability crossing the SI joint and there's no mobility on the patient's part. So there's an example of a trans ileic screw. You can get a nice window into S1, and there. so nice window into S1, and a nice window into S2. So this gives you nice and rigid fixation. And just the different views in Pieta, that's the sacrum, that's the ileum. So when you cross the SI joint, you've got one, two, and three extra cortices that you can engage. And that gives you far better stability than stopping in the middle of the sacrum, which has been the traditional teaching. But like I said, it doesn't give you enough fixation because you've only got fixation on the lateral ileum and middle of sacrum. So that's two cortices. Whereas if you cross the joint, you have an extra one, two, and three cortices. So uh, whenever you can, you must cross um, the uh, sacral ileic joint. Prophet Bayanda here. Did yeah, you leave those, did you leave those screws uh, that length? You didn't think they were too long. Well, I mean, what you want is to engage the you know the opposite cortex and. I'm joking, is, bro. Yeah, no, no, no. This, I'm not, no, I know, I know, I know. But I mean, I promise. You, I mean, this is honestly acceptable. No, I mean, there's no. Importantly, there's no prominent soft tissue here, so you can fill them and you get far better patches. Um. But, but I'll, remember that, I'll remember that next time I give you feedback on your femoral nail screws. <laughs> so then this is another example. Um, forgive the patient's name there. I must still blank that out. But again, like an example of, again, someone who's had previous spine surgery presents with uh, posterior lesions and you've got two transsacral screws. And there's enough you know, bony column to get two screws in the posterior cortex. And, um, and, and posterior sacrum. So now this is like, um, just like uh, 
an advanced type of um, of uh, pelvis fertility fractures, type four. This is an 88 year old female. So this is what she presented with. And again, you know, the risk here is that if you don't do you no know, further imaging, you tend to miss most of what's going on because on the surface of it, she looks like she's got a stable superior ramus fracture. If you look close enough, you may see the eyelid wing fracture, but you know, in reality, it doesn't look so bad like on the AP view. But once you start doing you know, further imaging, this is the outlet view. You can see that the eyelid wing fracture that looked quite benign on the AP is actually a complete fracture. So now she's, instead of here, where she looked like maybe a, like a stable lateral you know, compression injury, she then is looking more like a lateral compression type two with a complete um, eyelid wing fracture. There's still the superior ramus fracture. You can see some strange things happening on the left, but again, not sure what it is. So we take further imaging and that's now her inlet view. And now the inlet view, you can appreciate the posterior displacement of the hidden pelvis, further displacement of that eyelid wing fracture there's the superior ramus fracture and there's something happening um, at the same places as well and there's also something going on on the on the left side so if a patient like this then deserves a ct scan and we do a ct scan you can see there's involvement of both sides of the posterior ring um, that's the anterior pelvis confirming the presence of a non-union in the left superior ramus Again, another non-union at that right superior ramus that we saw earlier on. But importantly, this is the now the posterior component where there's involvement on both the right and left side of the, of the pelvis posteriorly. Now, the difficulty is that this is the image that you get when you screen in theater. Because um, with advancing disease, the spine basically invaginates into the pelvis and your landmarks get messed up completely. And that's the price you pay for intervening late. So you, your, your landmarks intra-op are not as great as what you expect to see. For example, in a true inlet view, you want to see the middle of the sacrum so you can aim your screws. You want to see the spinal canal so you know where to stay out, um, to, to, to steer clear off. But again, you know, it's not as clear here you can see the posterior part of the iliac wing, which, so that matches the anterior part of the, of the sacrum. So the whole pelvis has invaginated into, with mean, the whole spine into the pelvis. Again, different view interoperatively, very difficult to see, but at least here you can see the, the spinal canal, but it just makes it difficult to see the actual ilium. That's an outlet view. And with an eye of faith, you can see S1 foramina, S2 foramina. So your screw has to clear those foramina into the S1, um, S1 segment. So this is how we started the operation. Remember, she had an eyelid wing fracture. So this is the initial fixation. That is not a screw bianda. That's a temporary reduction pin. So. This is just holding uh, the plate in place, planning. This is the homens into the sacrum. So this is the SI joint. Now we start by plating the eyelid wing fracture. And this is um, a supracetabular screw or the so-called lateral compression two screw that starts anteriorly and um, proceeds all the way to posterior to give you further fixation on your eyelid wing. So this is how you take care of the eyelid wing fracture and the anterior component. So once that's done, so now the eyelid has been plated. This is now planning for the sacral eyelid screw, a little bit better view. So now you put the K wire crossing. So like I said, if you look here on the lateral, can you see the mouse? Yes. Okay, lovely. So if you look here, there's a little bit better bone in the middle here, there's more density, but on the lateral sacral area, there's no bone here. So this part doesn't count. You need to engage this ilium, this part of the sacrum and that ilium for you to get better fixation. 
So this is introducing the, the, the guide wire into the posterior sacrum. And the guide wire goes all the way across. So in this view, we've played here the other alec wing as well, because if you remember, both alec wings were involved. Now, again, um, spinal canal, sacrum. So you can get your screws in. And then know that I have not breached anteriorly. The K wires, I mean, the guide wires are still safe. And the idea is to get two transsacral screws for better fixation. And we've got that, uh, we've got those in place. Once that's done, you then can, so now on the other side, we do the lateral compression two screw or the suprastabular screw. So there's one on the right, this is the one on the left to further protect your alec wing. And this is the end result. So by this time, of course, she had um, bled quite a lot. She was um, quite unstable on the table. So the last thing I would have wanted to do for her was now to address the anterior ring. But remember anteriorly, she had that non-union of the superior ramus on the left and this involvement on the right. But she was just too unwell for, for me to then proceed anteriorly. So we just postponed that part. And, um, but ultimately what she then got was anterior pelvis plating. So ultimately that's what you want is to put all the screws in. This was just planning for the anterior plating. So the plate would sit like that. And this is the end result. So now I don't often do CT scans post-op, but with hair, I was quite nervous and worried about the placement of my screws because I thought if I bridge posteriorly, that's in the canal. If I bridge anteriorly, there's L5 nerve root coming out here. So I just did a CT scan to ensure that the hardware was in place. And, um, and yeah, it's all in place. So to, to summarize, um, so you, you must look out for pelvis fragility fractures um, and have a very, very low threshold for reviewing patients. So I'm not suggesting that everyone needs um, an operation, but at least in elderly patients, when you see the stable pelvis fracture, at least see them at six weeks. If they're healed at six weeks, then they'll be fine. But if there's no healing at six weeks, virtually all of those go on to non-union and um, and um, you can then at six weeks decide if you want maybe to intervene with, uh, if you have not done already, osteoporosis medication and referral to endocrine. But uh, if there's no union at six weeks, then see them between nine and 12 weeks. And if there's nothing at 12 weeks, then you have to intervene because they will not get better. As we've seen in the, with the many examples, outcomes are very poor with um, non-operative care. And um, when you do intervene, you need stable and rigid fixation and you must act um, freely early. And don't forget the underlying um, no, um, referral for osteoporosis. So just to, to recap that these are fairly rare injuries, but they are on, on, on the rise because many people, in fact, funny enough, many people are now on uh, bisphosphonates for neck of femur fractures. So the incidence of neck of femur fractures has decreased, but it's been overtaken by pelvis fractures. So bisphosphonates seem to have prevented more neck of femur fractures, but are now, you know, but patients are presenting now with uh, pelvis fractures. But of course, it's not to say that the pelvis fractures are being caused by the bisphosphonates because they're still protective towards pelvis fractures. But for some reason, the neck of femurs seem to be stronger in these patients than they, um, you know, um, than their pelvis is. So there's, there's a disproportionate increase in, in pelvis fractures. Right, so I'm gonna end there and stop sharing my screen and then I'm gonna take questions.